audience. Um, Jess Rowan, um, if you have any issues, please contact Jess um, and then at the end, either put your questions in the chat or raise your um, virtual hand and you can speak. Uh, I think that's it. I will hand over to Ian. Thanks very much. Thanks for turning up on such an auspicious day. Uh, uh, There's competing issues being discussed in the House of Commons. Um, none of them, like, any of those would help what we want to say very much. Um, so this is a paper we've been working on now for about six to nine months. Um, so we are going to present it collaboratively with the four of us. It's in four parts. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the sufficiency framework. And then Charlotte will look, look at applying that framework and defining necessary and excess housing. So applying the framework to housing. Then Stefan will present the findings of an analysis of the uh, English housing survey on the distribution of housing space and emissions. And then uh, Becky Tunstall will finish by looking at policy implications and towards a fair decarbonisation of housing. Um, so the housing, well, housing is such a big issue, so vast and ramifying. Um, it's, and it's clearly at the top of the political agenda, notably the crises of shortages, affordability and security. <clears throat> the dominant approach here, if we can summarise it, is a market fixing approach. It's about increasing the supply of new housing by removing planning and regulatory restrictions. Uh, and the figure of 300,000 new houses a year is banded around by both government and opposition. <clears throat> it's also there to provide subsidies and allowances and benefits to aid purchase and renting. Um, that's a broad, broad summary. Our research advocates a different approach, a sufficiency approach, to understand and analyze this crisis and potential policy responses. So this in turn addresses a fourth crisis, or big issue, the absence of fair decarbonization of UK housing. And that title, <coughs> excuse me, I've cough recently. That title is um, is is very explicit. There has to be decarbonisation, but it has to be fair. So we are not in this paper on the whole addressing the issues of affordability and security, though there are synergies between that and fair decarbonisation. So it's a synthetic agenda sort of setting paper. Um, <clears throat> So the basic idea of sufficiency is being increasingly discussed now by political theorists, climate scientists, um, social theorists, less so, social policy less so. Um, but there's a general agreement, I think, on what sufficiency is. I define it <clears throat> as, a, as a conceptual space between a floor and a ceiling, the floor to ensure decent minimum standards for all, and a ceiling above which lies unsustainable excess. And this can be applied, uh, in, as in this diagram, to various domains here well being, wealth, income, and consumption. Uh, in well being terms, we can talk about uh, people below the floor as being deprived in various ways. Um, and above, but also, this is a sort of crucial element in our paper, we have a ceiling. Above the ceiling, there's a notion of excess. In terms of uh, wealth and income, below the floor, often denoted by poverty, above the ceiling, riches. And in terms of consumption, um, necessities, there's a bundle of necessities which constitute the poor. So if you lack those, uh, you're below it. Um, at the top end, there's the notion of luxuries. Um, the sufficiency space then is the entire space between the floor and the ceiling. But notice here, it's, it's, it's not just about basic um, necessities and needs. Um, there are two parts of sufficiency, also designated here by flourishing, moderate incomes and comfort goods. It's not about the bare minimum, such as uh, is, uh, discussed by the uh, Loughborough minimum income. It's, it's, it's everything above there until we get to the ceiling. So in this paper, we're treating housing as a consumption good. Excuse me. Um, 
though it cannot be divorced from production and provisioning, as we'll see as we go along. Um, going back to my book, I argue that recomposition of consumption then becomes a new goal of public policy, along with redistribution of income and wealth. <clears throat> now we have to switch. Um, so just to say a few words then about the floor and the ceiling. Uh, the notion of the floor depends ultimately on some conception of human needs, and we've written about that at length. The human needs are the preconditions for actors to achieve any other value goals. It's not so much a goal, it's a, a universal precondition for people in all societies to go and act. Um, we distinguish here, as do all theorists, between needs and need satisfiers, <clears throat> which are contextual and socially constructed. So satisfiers are the goods, services, activities, and relationships that contribute to need satisfaction in any particular context. Um, this whole framework, needs satisfiers and so forth, figures in discourses on social rights and sustainable development goals. And need satisfiers are logically distinct from wants and preferences. So this is a major alternative to the fundamental uh, economic paradigm of uh, preference satisfaction. Um, changing again. Uh, is that happening up there? <laughs> <laughs> so more, more difficult is, is defining a ceiling of excess. Herman Daly, the um, ecological economist, distinguishes ethico-social and biophysical critiques of inequality. Uh, the ethico-social have been around for many, many millennia, um, right up to the present and a recent Example of this is Ingrid Wilbins' notion of limitarianism, which we she uh, addressed here at the LSE a few weeks ago. <clears throat> but I think it's fair to say that in recent years, this has been overtaken by the biophysical approach, the emergence of ecological and climate crises, which impose their own critique of inequality. Now, moving from, th this is not a simple issue. We start with the notion of biophysical limits. That then can be normatively or politically interpreted in terms of safe planetary boundaries. That's the job of the UNFCCC and other climate groups. Then that can, uh, is, is coupled with the documented inequality of consumption and emissions, which is vast, vast, uh, and which the IPCC and others document. And then from that follows a, a normative political case for ceilings on consumption in starting in the, the global north, in the rich countries. So there's, there's a move here from limits, ecological limits, to ceilings of consumption in, in rich countries. Uh, well, and amongst the rich and the poor countries too. So the, and then there's, this is coupled with an emerging fact supply-side decarbonisation cannot alone achieve net zero carbon by 2050. I think that's been accepted by all climate scientists. Therefore, demand-side mitigation policies are also needed. Demand-side, starting in the rich countries. But once you're into demand-side mitigation, issues of justice and fairness are raised. Whose consumption should be cut? Uh, and for several decades now, there's been discussions following Professor Shu and others, including me, myself, about necessities and luxuries. Necessities have priority over luxuries. So in this uh, way, the, the ethico-social and the biophysical critiques come together, and we return to this notion of a space between the two, uh, which I started off with. Okay. So now I'll turn over to Charlotte. I'm going to stand up if that's okay. <laughs> um, all right, so as Ian touched upon, it is the rising inequality and deprivation across the housing sector, but also its vast carbon intensity, which emphasizes the vital need to apply a sufficiency framework to understand and respond to the housing crisis. So in 2019, the UK Committee on Climate Change reported that 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the UK can be attribu attributed to domestic heating, while a further 4% is generated from the use of electricity in the home for appliances and lighting. 
So to bring down emissions in line with the UK's net zero target for 2050 will require rapid and radical transformations in housing policy. A sufficiency strategy demands that decarbonisation is done in a just and fair way and therefore aims to address the dual social and environmental symptoms of the housing crisis in tandem. And it does this by requiring that excess consumption is shrunk or redistributed, while a certain minimum threshold for need is guaranteed for all. So how do we begin to conceive of such notions of excess and need? Well, we here conceive of um, shelter as a basic human need or a certain minima which enables someone to participate fully in a given society. Need satisfiers are relative to context. So, for example, there are many different forms of dwelling which could meet the given specifications of um, comfort or protection that shelter may require. A current dilemma we are currently experiencing in the UK is that um, accepted standards of housing have risen drastically over the past century. And of course, with these rise in standards has been a huge rise in carbon emissions. So it is simply the case that living according to these high standards of housing is ecologically unsustainable. But of course, it's also the case that it would be unfair and unjust to prescribe that anyone live um, in such a way that falls short of social standards as they exist in the UK today. So that is why the imperative exists to fashion a housing corridor, which takes us swiftly to a state of sufficiency, but starting from where we are now. Now, while there are, of course, numerous dimensions of housing to consider when devising such a corridor, such as housing affordability, security or quality, we initially focus here on housing space. Um, this is on account of the uh, strong correlation between residential energy consumption and dwelling size, but also on account of the fact that we could quantify and distribute housing space into categories of deprivation, sufficiency and excess. Um, to legitimately uh, determine the floors and ceilings of the housing space corridor ideally requires collective deliberation. So specifically the combination of lay and specialist knowledge derived from dialogue between citizens and experts. But unfortunately, there are currently no adequate deliberative studies that we could use for this purpose. So instead, we predominantly make do with official governmental housing standards, um, which um, can claim some degree of democratic credibility, while also drawing from one relevant focus group study. So in determining the minimum threshold for housing space, two official standards can be employed. The first is the bedroom standard, which was established in 1961. And it's commonly used in UK housing statistics um, and also by social landlords. Um, this, this standard mandates that a separate bedroom should be provided to single adults, couples, pairs of children aged 10 years or under, and pa pairs of same-sex persons aged 10 to 20. And there are a few other caveats, but that is the bulk of it. And then the second standard is the UK's National Space Standard, which was launched in 2015. This dictates requirements for the gross internal floor area per person, but is strictly equivalized. Our slight simplification of the standard admits 40 meters squared per person with an additional 10 meters squared for each extra person in a household. So these are the two distinct lower threshold standards that we use to determine housing sufficiency in the UK. And we do additionally include homelessness as a measure of deprivation, which you will see on the summary table. So determining maximum thresholds for housing space is a much more innovative endeavor and a significantly trickier one. Um, there is unsurprisingly no policy threshold in the UK on housing maxima. And while there is a literature on ceilings for the consumption of housing, there is limited deliberative research on this subject. The only alternative to expert judgments um, has been the consensual focus group study undertaken by case colleagues and the minimum income standard team at Loughborough University. So this study explored public perceptions of the rich and the wealthy. Distinctions between the categories of the comfortable and the wealthy 
um, provided glimpses of what groups of citizens may regard as excess, which included larger homes and second homes. So drawing from this, we define a generous threshold of excess floor space as two or more bedrooms above the bedroom standard and more than double the space standard per equivalized person. So this amounts to 80 meters squared for a single person and 100 meters squared for a household of two people and so on. Um, we also add second or multiple homes to this threshold. Um, and it's worth noting that the bedroom standard does regard more than one bedroom above the standard as under occupation. So that gives us a bit more confidence in defining two or more bedrooms above the standard as excess. So this table here just summarizes these lower and upper thresholds of our housing space corridor um, and what we subsequently use to calculate housing deprivation, sufficiency and excess in England. So on that note, I'll hand over to you, Stefan. Fantastic. Um, what we did next is, if you um, just really click, do I click my, we're just left right. and right, yeah. up and down. Left and right. Okay, what we did next is, we applied the framework to the English housing stock using the English housing survey. Now the English housing survey is a fantastic data set because it includes both data on the dwelling stock and on households at the same time, which is, which is quite unusual in the international context. Um, so here I have a summary of what we did. Um, because when you do this type of analysis, what is important to note is that you can take two different perspectives. One is looking at it from the perspective of the household, the other one is to look at it from the perspective of the housing stock. And we worked that out discussing it after a while because we talk, talk, but, um, kept talking past each other. And here we got an example of this, where we have one household, which consists of one person, which, like Charlie just said, might need 40 square meters, we assume. And this, yeah, this person lives in one housing unit that has 100 square meters. Now, looking at it from the housing stock perspective, we see that this person needs 40 square meters for their housing needs. We generously assume there is another 40 square meters that can be used as, you know, reasonable spare bedrooms, large lounges and so forth. And beyond that, anything beyond that double the needs threshold is excess housing. Now, because this person on the left tops out at excess um, consumption, um, the person is classified as an excess household um, and uh, going into that category. Um, if the same person lived now on 30 square meters, you had another 30 square meters in the housing stock perspective that are used for meeting this person's housing needs, but there are another 10 square meters that are missing. Um, so the person's needs are not met, which means it's topping out at a sort of lack category space that doesn't have. So the person is classified as a deprived person because it doesn't, uh, their, their needs are not met. Now, based on this, Always bear this in mind, and, and also bear in mind that you know the threshold of excess is, that we give is relatively generous. Based on that, we can move into households. This is now the, the left-hand side perspective. And what we see is here we apply the two standards that we um, that Charlotte introduced um, to all households in England, the way they occupy the English housing stock. And what we see is that around 30%, based on the standard you use, um, are households with excess housing, households that, that, that are go beyond twice what they actually need. Um, and around 10% are households that are space deprived. And you can see here also the distinction that the, the floor space metric we use is slightly, slightly more generous. So whenever you see orange numbers going forward, bear in mind that this is, these are probably understatements. There's probably more excess in the system than we, um, than we show here. Um, now, then we looked into who these excess households are. And we, the English Housing Survey offers lots of different um, characteristics of households to look at. Um, so we went through them and what we found two that are particularly striking. And one of them is um, tenure. Um, and here we got plotted on in dark, the um, excess space. Now we're talking in um, all the square meters that are excess in, in the housing. Uh, no, not all the, no, sorry, all the households. I'm starting to mix up myself. We're looking at households here. These are all the households that are topping out in orange. And of those, 60% are owner occupiers. This is compared to the owner occupiers that don't have a mortgage. Um, of those, that compares to 35% of all households in England actually being in that category. Um, whereas mortgage owners are more or less how you would expect them to be in terms of their excess consumption. Um, whereas private and social renters, 
they don't have a lot of excess. Their share of excess consumption is incredibly low, especially especially social renters. Um, the other category we, we found quite striking is the type of household. Um, and here we have especially um, couple and single households um, over 60 years old with a head of household that's over 60 years old um, that accounts for um, significantly more um, um, a significantly higher share of households um, with excess consumption than you would expect. Uh, and you see on, on the right hand side of the graph, you see that that couples with dependents and, and single parents um, with dependents um, don't have a lot of um, excess floor space as we would expect them. Sorry, Stephen, the, the light yeah. bar shows the... So you can't see that's a legend down here, yeah. Um, the light bar is the share of the population that falls into that category, and the dark bar is um, the share of the excess floor space that falls into that category, ex ex excess households. Falls. So keep correcting myself. You see, I've been, I've been looking at the, at the stock perspective that we... Um, and here we have a cross, now we can't see that. Can we move that bar? Can we move that so, bar at the bottom to the top of the screen? Um, the screen there as well, but we can like it, but... Here we have a cross okay. examination of those two criteria. And what is really interesting is that we have two groups here, which are outright owners with a head of household over 60, who account for practically half of the excess, um, excess households. Um, and we have another cluster around mortgaged households with, um, with, with couples, in presumably in many cases have double, double income because they can afford a mortgage. Um, so that's another cluster of, of, of households that, that have access housing. Um, I won't go into more detail now because Becky's going to talk about some of the policy implications of that. Um, we have... Oh, I was responding. Oh, Ellie, you need to click also. Um, too far away now. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, here we go. And here we look at the other perspective. We look at square meters. We look at the housing stock. And um, the, um, so this is like all looking at every single square meter in England and deciding if this particular square meter is used to satisfy somebody's housing needs or if it's used for something else. And the good news is that around 80% of all square meters in England are actually used for meeting somebody's housing needs in terms of space or reasonable spare bedroom in the reasonable spare bedroom comfort category. We also have, however, 13% of square meters that are used beyond that excess thr uh, threshold, which is quite generous again. Um, so that's, that's quite, quite a significant chunk um, um, given, given that we have housing deprivation as well. Um, now on the right hand side, the three little bars, I think that's quite interesting because we have two important phenomena that often are in the headlines, which are vacant dwellings and second homes and the homeless. Now, these are qualitatively very important phenomena, um, but we can see here that in terms of their scale, in terms of how many square meters we would actually need to house the homeless, it's, 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 just, it's, wildly, it's wildly smaller. Than, than the entire house, entire floor space, including the floor space that we don't use to meet other people's housing needs. And including, we have a lot of deprivation inside occupied dwellings, the same way as we have a lot of excess housing, a lot of vacancy inside occupied dwellings compared to, compared to buildings, entire buildings that are actually vacant. So this is, there's a lot of, in a way, these headline phenomena are, you can say, at the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the housing problem is actually taking place behind closed doors. Um, I'll try to open those doors a bit here with this data. Um, and then we have emissions, mm -hmm. which traces floor space. Now, that's a methodological thing, of course. And um, for two reasons, and Charlotte introduced that, the idea that floor, the floor space is the best, best ex, um, predictor of emissions, but also the method we use here is that we measure emissions based on the quality of the floor space. The, the, the characteristics um, of the building, whether it's well insulated and so forth, it doesn't take into account mm -hmm. consum actual consumption patterns that might impact us as well. But what we see here is, despite this, we can see it doesn't entirely trace um, the floor space distribution. Again, a lot of a lot of emissions that are currently used for actually meeting people's housing and uh, heating needs. But we can see here that 17%, not 13%, of excess emissions. Um, our, uh, our emissions are excess. Um, and that is because we, when we look at it, is that 
dwellings that have excess space tend to be more emitting, even based on their characteristics, before you take into account that they may be um, um, dwelled in by, um, by people who you know, own them outright and don't pay rent and you know, have to care less about um, heating costs and so forth, potentially. Like we can see here that, that those dwellings are particularly, um, particularly emitting. And again, I won't go much further into it because we talk about it and you know, um, now what the, who that might be and what the policy implications might be. Thank you. Thank you. Well, oh dear, in a way I've got quite a difficult job here. You can see the policy problem that's been set up. <laughs> so um, decarbonisation of housing is urgent. Fair de decarbonisation is equally urgent. But you can see that if you're thinking about redistribution of housing space, the people who've got the excess housing space are very strongly represented political lobby groups. Um, and some of the easier options dealing with other issues around the housing system have already been tried and are, are doing as much as they can. But let's, let's just look. Although everything is extremely urgent, I have to say we haven't yet got a completely worked out policy plan ready to go. So apologies, these are some ideas and we look forward to your contributions to the discussion. Okay. So just looking at the situation, um, we need to devise a housing space corridor leading from our current unequal and unsustainable emissions to um, a sustainable position that's also fair. So, Work to improve the energy efficiency of housing is important, but that won't deal with the, the um, injustice that's already in the system. And in fact, efficiency alone, even if it rapidly increased, um, wouldn't get us there in time. So we've got to make use of some of the housing that we have already in a better way. Um, so really, we should try not to be building more housing Gulp. I'm a housing person. All my life I've been saying let's build more housing. But there are arguments here, there's evidence here to say that building more housing involves not just the um, carbon that's consumed in its construction, but also the carbon that will be used every year onwards. Um, getting to zero carbon on construction and use is very difficult, and we're not going fast enough. So we should have a presumption against new house building um, and there's a further argument which actually comes from my own work so if you look at the way the housing systems worked over the 20th century vast amounts of natural resources went in vast amounts of capital and effort um, and the average amount of housing space went up significantly but for the worst off 10% of people in terms of housing space, it took most of the 20th century to get to what had been the average in 1911. And over the last three decades, those people have had no improvement. And if you're a Londoner, over the last two decades, nearly everybody's had no improvement in the average housing space and overcrowding is far more significant problems. So the evidence is that trickle down or just building as normal is not an effective or efficient way of dealing with homelessness and overcrowding. And we also have the environmental imperative. So we can achieve justice. We can get rid of overcrowding and homelessness um, if we adopt the sufficiency framework. So let's have a look at some ideas. Um, so we're arguing that going full steam ahead on energy efficiency is really important. And there were major strides made in the 20, 2000s and 2010s, but progress has slowed down. And um, Ian picked up this quote from Lord Deben from a couple of years, just pointing this out. Um, this is the big gap in, in British um, carbon policy um, and things that are slowing down, going backwards. In effect, there's been a lost decade. Um, and although this is now the issue, um, retrofitting the current housing stock is high up the political agenda, it's just still not going fast enough. Um, so we also need to think about doing more with 
using the stock we have differently and making better use of spare rooms. So um, what policies to turn to? Just thinking schematically, um, if you want to discourage something, if you want to provide different incentives, think about tax and regulation. And there are lots of people talking about tax and regulation within housing. We could think about applying this to second homes, vacant homes, and also to this issue of excess space within existing households. But I'm sure you'll immediately say we haven't managed to deal with property taxation in Britain and the reform of council tax in England and Wales for 30 years. Why are we suddenly going to be able to do it now in the climate emergency? Um, in fact, things are going perhaps the other way. We talk about removing aspects of inheritance tax. So I would argue we can learn from one example where this has happened, which is the introduction of the bedroom tax or the um, removal of the spare room subsidy within social housing and um, from 2012 onwards. And this shows you what you can do, what you can't do, what the costs and benefits are. So for a group of people who are politicians feel happier to meddle with as social housing residents, the policy was introduced with the aim of um, encouraging more efficient use of the housing stock and removing excess space. But within the subset of social housing residents, it was only applied to, again, a group who, who um, policymakers felt they could um, threaten in a way, which was people claiming housing benefit under the age of 60. And as you can see, that it's actually older people who tend to have more space. So the policy missed the target in that sense. Um, and also the early evaluations that have taken place showed that instead of encouraging movement, mainly what happened was that people just paid up. So in effect, they were willing to put up with a 25% tax on their housing benefit income in order not to move. And this shows you what you're up against. That's with people who were on very low incomes. So the problems in getting people to move are enormous. And there's a huge amount of case law and political discussions about the reasons that people didn't want to move. Um, and so this is what we're going to be up against with millions of wealthy owner occupiers as well. Um, but the, the policy also showed um, other ways to, to approach things. Mm -hmm. so there hasn't been a long term evaluation of this policy, but the short term evaluation showed that um, what didn't happen was that landlords were allocating differently. So there has been a change in the, in the patterns of occupation in social housing due to this policy, but it's mainly not because people moved. It's mainly because new, new residents were allocated without spare bedrooms. And there are great costs to this. Um, and the standards being used were with the uh, minimum sufficiency standards. They were not up to, it was not really thinking about the excess we're thinking about. And as, as you've seen, the, that social housing doesn't have the excess using the standards we used. Um, but still, there's a lot to learn from that policy. Um, Stefan made the point that there's been an experience of taxing excess housing in um, Germany. But like with all taxation systems, the, the people on higher incomes will maybe pay up. As with the bedroom tax, people on low incomes also paid up to avoid moving. Um, there might be other sorts of policies. So another approach would be to think about raising the price of not the housing itself, but um, sustaining the housing. So why is it cheaper to buy energy in la um, large amounts? Perhaps we could think about reversing that so that it's cheaper to start with. There's a huge amount of social policy on energy costs. And there's a mini welfare state within utility pricing as it is, and there could be more done in that area. On the other hand, regulation may be a more attractive or um, easier road to go down than taxation. You can see we're just beginning to touch at some of the edges of these ideas. Um, what about another approach? Mm -hmm. What about instead of taxing, what about actually moving around um, or providing incentives to do that? And again, you can learn a lot here from social housing for what um, might be happening in the future in outright ownership. So social landlords um, crystallise the cost of un, um, under occupation because they have to pay for temporary accommodation for families who can't get into the social housing stock 
Um, and landlords are very conscious that having um, under occupation costs them money day by day, week by week. And so they, this has been going on for decades, but they have schemes to help and encourage people who've got spare rooms to move. And these include services, and these are the kind of services you might want to build in for um, homeowners. So social landlords find the next home, of course, only within their stock, and it's what they have and what they offer, but they provide that service. They then may provide support in moving, in, they may provide money for decorations, to try and smooth the way and help people make this choice. And they also pay people several thousand pounds. You know, it depends on the market, depends on the cost of temporary accommodation, the need for family accommodation, but they pay a premium to people to agree to move. And so these are sort of models for what might go on in home ownership. But um, going back to the bedroom tax example, I mean, one of the reasons that people didn't move when they were under this really strong financial pressure to do so <clears throat> wasn't simply that they loved their family at home and they, all their children had grown up there and all their memories were there and so on. It was also because there was nowhere suitable for them to go. Not the right kind of accommodation of the right size that would fit the policy. So there is a, a mismatch. We don't have enough of the one and two bedroom homes nationwide. And particularly, you're going to need them in similar locations to where the larger homes are. And this is going to be a problem across 10 years. Um, and, and the situation with the bedroom tax became very, you know, absolutely ridiculous and not very green, where, for example, local authorities were knocking down family homes because they didn't have any households they could allocate to them who would be able to escape the bedroom tax and then cramming those people into one bedroom flats. Um, so the huge carbon cost there. So another issue to think about is single person households. There's a long term trend um, with increasing numbers of people living on their own. And that does have obvious carbon and space implications. So single people usually have a kitchen, bathroom, living room, bedroom. Maybe they have a spare bedroom. Maybe they have two spare bedrooms and they hit the ceiling. They have more than 40 metres space and um, if you have two people in that same home they're sharing all of that space so it's much more efficient in that sense um what in 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 the past students didn't have their own bathrooms in student accommodation now increasingly they do in the past couples were willing to share a bathroom children shared the family bathroom increasingly people have more and they have their own and don't share. So it seems that another area to explore is re-encouraging sharing and all kinds of interesting experiments with getting people to share whatever you can in terms of space and these carbon intensive facilities like bathrooms and so on. Um, but again, we, we are facing a climate emergency and there's nothing slower than setting up a housing car. <laughs> experience. So we should do all we can to encourage these sorts of things, but we can't pin our hopes on them. However, the planning system, I look more broadly at limiting additional space, bathrooms and so on in, in um, the homes that, that are being built and the homes that exist at the moment. Right, I mustn't use up too much more time. Okay, and now we've had a lot of um, argument about this in the team, <clears throat> but it's very noticeable that housing space is used much more efficiently within social housing and the private rental sector than the other own, own, um, ownership tenures. And also from my own work, looking at the early part of the 20th century when there was a huge amount of social housing building, that was also the time when housing space inequalities reduced. And it was only after 1981 when that development stopped, that housing space inequalities began to run away again and are now back to um, the early 20th century levels. So if you were to focus new build on social housing, you could efficiently resolve overcrowding and homelessness with minimum extra construction impacts on carbon budgets. And the more social housing there is, under current situations, the more efficiently the stock will be used because there are very tough allocations policies and there's pressure to move people around if need be. 
Okay, I'm going to hand over to Ian. Oh, decent homes for all within planetary boundaries. <laughs> That's the slogan for um for <laughs> efficiency. Now, fair decarbonisation entails redistribution and recomposition alongside retrofitting and some new build. That's another big conclusion. So they are these are radical proposals, but without them, however efficient, carbon efficient the housing stock is made, it will not become more effective at delivering decent accommodation to households who need it, nor will it hit near zero emissions. Without a sufficiency strategy, new house building will continuously be encouraged with associated environmental costs. So that's a summary. Uh, that's an interesting question at the end, especially <laughs> at a time when the budget's being discussed. So uh, we'll end there. Brilliant. Thank you all so much.